All right, good afternoon, everybody. We're just letting everybody enter the space right now. Thank you for joining us today for our Strategic Directions 2020 Plus uh, webinar for all of our prospective families. It will take a minute for us to load everybody. We were thrilled when we took a look at the attendee list today. And for my colleagues who aren't aware of this, we've actually got attendees from, of course, across the GTA, but across the globe. Um, we have attendees from five different countries as well as Canada. Um, and so uh, big thank you to the parents who are joining us in the middle of the night um, from the other side of the globe and our families in Europe who are joining us at what must be dinner time over there. So we're just going to give everybody a moment um, as people come in. For those who don't know me, my name is Maggie Houston White and I'm the Director of Strategic Enrollment Management here at the school. And what that means is my job is to not over not only oversee the recruitment and admission process at the school, but also the retention of students and families at the school. So ensuring that there's a seamless transition from when you first look at the school to when you're admitted to the school to the day that you graduate, um, making sure you feel connected and well informed throughout. Okay, our numbers seem to be leveling off today. And for my colleagues on uh, this webinar, you'll be pleased working in schools for the last 25 years. I know a thing or two about learning goals. You've trained me well. So today in our webinar, what we're hoping you'll learn is why our teaching and learning philosophy leads to such successful graduates, learn about our well-being program and how it supports our academic program, and really understand our strategic direction and why it's innovating to ensure our graduates graduates are future ready. It's important to us um, that you have an understanding of as prospective parents on where Havergal is and where we are going. So I'm going to start by introducing uh, my colleagues, Shauna Davis, who is the Vice Principal of Teaching and Learning. Shauna, if you could give a quick wave. Uh, Garth Nichols, who is our Vice Principal of Strategic Innovation and Design and Lindsay Norberg, who is our associate head of school, as well as being the head of our, um, our senior school. Okay, I'm sharing a screen with, my, um, with a PowerPoint here, but I may end up turning that off in a minute and just having us all on the screen. All right, so Seanad, I'm gonna start with you and ask you to speak to families about teaching and learning in our strategic directions. Thanks, Maggie. So as you probably know, Havergal is a strong academic school and we have a very deliberate focus on liberal arts. We are a school with 126 years of traditions, but our approach to education is not traditional. We have a long-standing focus on teaching for understanding, which we believe will prepare girls to make a difference in the world through using their education. As a liberal arts focused school, we're able to provide students with a very strong and diverse program in courses to the grade 12 level in all of the subject areas, which is unusual in a school. And being able to provide students with experiences in this great breadth of disciplines and to develop an understanding of disciplinary specific thinking skills, concepts and methods is really important in a time when we're preparing girls for a world that we can't really imagine. Girls benefit from such an approach because it keeps their options open much longer and allows them to experience different subjects taught by subject specialists and taught in depth. And that allows them to apply those different disciplinary thinkings to solve complex problems that require an integrated thinking process. We believe it's important to help students learn how to learn. And to do that, they need to learn the key concepts skills and ways of thinking. They need to learn how to work within a discipline in order to leverage that discipline in complex problems that are multidisciplinary. Providing the liberal arts program allows the girls to keep their options open. They don't specialize too early uh, and they have a lot of practice learning with ideas uh, to increase what they know, can do and understand. What is important in all of this is understanding the relationship between the facts the ability to transfer that understanding to new situations and the ability to use ideas to suit, solve problems. 
So for an example, students learn how geographers think and how they use data and then use that information to decide whether or not the Northern Gateway pipeline should happen and explain why. They use their understanding of parabolas and quadratic equations to analyze and model the flight of an angry bird in a hypothetical criminal case. Our youngest students are taught to analyze stories and to consider the question about what makes a good friend or why does the illustrator of the book choose those particular pictures. And these are just many, many of the ways that students are expected to think within and between disciplines. And while much of the content of school is similar or the same to when you were at school, how students are expected to engage in that has changed. And that's because the world no longer rewards people for what they know, because we have Google, but what they can do with what they know, because we're educating children for a time we can't imagine, which requires them to be adaptable, creative, and critical thinkers who have learned how to learn and how to be critical consumers of what they are learning. Our students use technology from JK to 12 to enhance their learning in both knowledge acquisition and knowledge generation. They learn in spaces that are designed for learning with lots of natural light, clean surfaces and flexible seating, which reflects our philosophy of, of having girls work in collaborative teams. We work to maintain a balance between the acquisition of specific knowledge and skills and the development of thinking and understanding with the end goal of having students who can do something. That doesn't mean that the knowledge and skills are not important because they are, and students are expected to be able to spell, write clearly, know their number facts, name the provinces and capitals, and have a lot of other useful information at their fingertips. But the reason why they need to know those, those things is to be able to use that knowledge. In our assessment process, students have to have knowledge they can use to solve unique problems and our assessment is mirrored in the admission process where students are asked to solve problems during the interview, an end on demand task, but also to bring examples of their deeper work and to be able to talk to their learning. And this emphasizes the importance of student reflection in how learning happens in the school. This is an academically demanding school and students need to be prepared for the pace of the school. And a lot of that is because our teachers are the specialists in their fields and the level of discourse and academic challenge is high. Students need to be committed to their own learning and to enjoy that concept of academic challenge, but they're also supported in their learning journey by their teachers and students who need extra support can also access that support through their guidance counselor and through them to learning support specialist when it's necessary. So at Havergal, we try to be all things to all of our girls and to make sure that they are successful as they go forward into the world. Thank you so much. Thanks, Seanad. I'm going to transition into you, Lindsay, because I think well-being, our well-being program, because it really supports um, and is a huge pillar for our academic program, perhaps you could speak to that from a JK to grade 12 lens. Thank you, Maggie. And yes, just as you say it, and as Sean it articulates as well, the goal here is to support our academic program. Our overall objective with our well-being program at Havergold is to enable students to develop the skills and strategies to be resilient and agile leaders. We want them to have the essential skills that they need to thrive in all stages of their lives, although this might look different at different ages from JK to grade 12 and then beyond the walls of Havergold. All of our work in our well-being program is driven by our school values, integrity, inquiry, courage, and compassion. At the end of the day, we want the students to have the skills to make informed and responsible decisions, manage difficult situations, know when to get to support. We want them to understand their own mental health and have the tools that they need to support their learning and overcome challenges. We want them to have a sense of connectedness, which includes building positive relationships and making sure that they're engaged with the Havergal community. We know the academic opportunities at Havergal are unparalleled, just as Sean has articulated. But it's also the ability to develop a robust toolkit that will enable students to take these academic skills and thrive throughout their lives. This includes the executive functioning skills to manage and plan their work and their lives accordingly, the communication skills to work with a variety of different people, conflict management skills and the ability to resolve conflicts independently, be aware of their own emotions and, and manage their emotions appropriately, have the capacity for a positive outlook, nurture positive relationships, engage in physical activities and healthy choices, and connect with their physical environment. Each of these skills are important. 
These skills are taught from JK to grade 12, and they look the same and different from JK to 12, because as, as a student progresses in their time at Havergal, they, the elements are the same, but the actual way that they apply them to their lives look different. Let's start with the junior school. The well-being program happens every day in the junior school in different ways throughout the student's day. It may begin at the beginning of the week with prayers. And at prayers, the school chaplain and the head of our junior school might be introducing the student rights and responsibilities document. They would talk about the different elements of the rights and responsibilities document uh, connected to our school values and our school culture and talk about what it feels like and looks like in the junior school when we uphold these rights and responsibilities. But as the student progresses through their week, they will then have opportunities with their classroom teachers to role, pl role play different aspects of these responsibilities and talk about different elements. Similarly, there may be issues that, are, that come up in their classroom uh, over time. And then the students and their teachers will look back at the rights and responsibilities and explore them further. So what we will do with some of these different skills is explore them in different ways, whether it's JK to grade six in prayers, in smaller groups in the classroom, or one-on-one -on -one with teachers and a student. There are other elements to this well-being program throughout the week. There's opportunities for students to explore mindfulness or physical activity. Again, essential tools that students will use to become resilient and agile leaders. Emotional regulation is another key component in junior school and learning for students in terms of how to manage their own emotions. It could begin similarly to the way Shauna talked about, about reading a book and talking about different characters and how they navigated problems. But then what is essential is the opportunity to practice these skills. As students progress from the junior school at Havergal into the upper school, the skills are the same, but then they are applied differently. In middle school, as students come into grade seven, now instead of having a homeroom teacher, they have a form teacher and their form teacher becomes their main point of contact. It's through their form that they will develop key social connection and it's their form teacher that will help the student feel known, valued and, and really as a the sense of belonging. Because now this student will go into a rotary class where they will meet with different subject specialists. The well-being program in the middle school is led by the guidance counselors. There are two guidance counselors for grades seven and eight. And not only will these guidance counselors provide individualized one on one support for students, but they will also run a regular well being program for students. At the core of this middle school program is, is helping these middle school students find their voice and develop agency so that they can lead and make decisions. For example, it could be the skills for how to contact teachers, ask for help when they need it, um, let them know when they're having difficulty, opposed to relying on their parents as they may have when they were younger, making sure that they have the skills themselves to be able to do that. It could be as simple as learning how to write an email to a teacher or how to ask for help. At the same time in middle school, shifting friendships are another key component and learning how to have the skills to nurture these different relationships. Friendships may go from friendships that were developed out of proximity and, and instead they might be developing relationships with students who have more shared interests. And as they move through these friendships, knowing that this is normal and natural as part of their development. As students progress to senior school, grade nine to 12, the program evolves further. Opposed to being in a form, students are in what we would call an advisory group. Havergal's house system plays an essential role in senior school life, again, with a real focus on connection and belonging. All students meet every day in their houses with their advisory groups. Their advisory groups are the same group of students that they know throughout the entire four years at Havergal. And this is essential so that there's a real sense of continuity throughout a student's senior school experience. They'll be with the same advisor and with the same group of students for the entire four years. It's with these students as well that they will explore nurturing positive relationships, managing conflict, discussing issues that come forward to them. As well, in senior school, guidance counselors lead regular well-being programming. Similar to junior school, it could be a topic that's discussed in prayers at the beginning of the week, and then an idea that is explored more deliberately through the schools, through the grade program, through the guidance counselor. And it could be a discussion about resilience and overcoming challenges and again the opportunity to practice them. Um, 
students really at this age will be will have a variety of tools in their toolkit and instead of being told which tool to use they will be given the choices and really thinking about which tool they want to access and thinking about what they want to use similarly they could be looking at different time management skills and thinking back on the different skills they've been taught but as their academic career has progressed maybe some tools have worked well for them and it's time to make use of other tools as well, in the upper school, students have guidance counselors who will meet one-on-one -on -one with students when they have more challenges or need an opportunity for one-to-one -one support. Again, the goal of the well-being program at Havergal is for students to be able to thrive throughout their lives. We want them to leave here not only with the academic skills, but with the well-being tools that enables them to really make use of that academic opportunity they've had here at Havergal. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Garth, I'm going to get you to speak right now. And I, for those who've been watching carefully, I, Garth uh, is our uh, oversees something called HCX and is very involved with our students, as are Shauna and Lindsay. And I noticed a student tried to walk into your office just there. So, well, well done with the with uh, navigating that one. But Garth, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thanks, Maggie, and uh, welcome, everybody. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, that Shauna, both Shauna and Lindsay have spoken so, so well about the foundation of the school. Um, my role as Vice Principal of Strategic Innovation Design is really to uh, support the school moving forward in a, in a direction. And strategy requires knowing where we go. Uh, we have a North Star, and that's our portrait of a grad. And that's really what you're looking at right now. Our grads are gonna be graduating into a practice of thought, into a practice of ways of being. And this, port this, this portrait, if you will, was established through a couple years of research, both within the educational sector, so working uh, with and alongside educators from around the world, but also outside of the educational sector. We were looking to the OECD, we were looking to the World Economic Forum and the DQ Institute. And these are positioned in a model of practice so that they are inspired to action. They're globally minded. They're self-directed lifelong learners. They lean into empathy. They lead with integrity. They work with flexibility and adaptability. They're digital navigators and they're future ready. This is a really powerful, powerful direction that we're moving in. And Long before the, the school closures with the pandemic, we had established this portrait and we'd established our strategic direction. And it, the strategic direction asked us to consider a digital transformation to meet these needs. Um, our world is no longer talking about educational technology because technology just exists. It's something that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And I don't know about you, uh, but some of you may experience it on a minute-to-minute -minute basis as well. And so our strategic direction has called for this, this flexibility, this nimbleness, um, and for all of us within our community to be digital navigators. And out of this emerges an innovation hub, HCX. And this will guide and lead our entire community in terms of curriculum design, in terms of understanding our uh, digital ecosystem and much more. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some key projects that are coming out of HCX. HCX is the engine that drives the strategic direction. And so we capture these in projects. And our first project is a course and the course is called DQ. And that's our sort of short form for digital wisdom. And this course wraps into it and integrates it integrates with well-being, as Lindsay has talked about, academic rigor, as Shauna has addressed, also um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and a, and a lens for diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as student agency. Our faculty member who's teaching this course right now has just finished the first cohort in grade seven, and it was incredible to watch. This course is going to run from grade five to grade eight. So it's a four year course, but it's run in intensives. So we want to make sure that students are deep diving into these issues and explorations. And so to give you an example, I was in the, the grade seven course just on Tuesday, and it was amazing to watch these students address issues of race, diversity, and inclusion, 
alongside artificial intelligence. We listened to a wonderful poet called the Poet of Code. We followed her on Twitter for a little bit. We listened to her poem. And then we talked about the role that artificial intelligence plays in our lives from the mundane, you know, to online shopping to what it might become. And we asked some really good questions. And some of the students were talking about how artificial intelligence in the car that they, that they're, you know, driving or that their family has, has artificial intelligence built into it. And then one student asked, does that make us a better driver? And I thought that was just such a great question. Uh, and so these, these, this course is designed to really explore these different elements of it. Now, alongside this, we're running a blended learning project. And so this course is integrating blended learning, which, is, which means that students are working on course content in an asynchronous fashion. It's content that isn't locked into the day to day, but rather informs the nature of the course. And one thing I'm excited to share with you is that we're piloting, um, we're piloting a partnership with a third party named Amitros and students will be using artificial intelligence and, and actually hands on learning with and from artificial intelligence. Now, on one level, that sounds really cool. But on another level, on a deeper level, we're going to be talking to them about what that means to actually work and learn with artificial intelligence. And so students are going to be addressing these issues through different lenses, but also through deep critical thinking, which is the foundation of our academic program. Another project that we have is professional learning. We understand that a digital transformation such uh, of this nature requires all of us to be lifelong learners. And when I say all of us, I mean our faculty and staff, our administrators, our families, and our students, as well as our partners that we, that we um, do, our, do this work with. And so our professional learning will be alongside student learning. Our family learning will be alongside student and our faculty learning as well. So we're really excited about these projects uh, coming out of HCX. And again, it is leading towards ensuring that we are meeting this direction. We are meeting the call to action that our portrait of a grad is asking us to do. Thanks, Maggie. Fantastic, Garth. Um, I think it's important to note right now that what you've heard everybody talk about is a strategic direction, not a strategic plan. And to me, that really speaks to the thoughtful nature that's always been a part of Havergal. A strategic plan is something where you have goals that you're simply checking off. For us, this is a strategic direction. And it was a bit ironic when we were working on our strategic direction last fall, we had no idea that this is where we were going to end up. And I really appreciate all the questions that were submitted in advance of this presentation. And I, and I hope we've covered that. But there are some questions that have come through now, and I invite you to um, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to submit a question. But I know there was um, a couple that we haven't gotten to, and I'm going to start um, with you, well, maybe with all three of you. Learning looks different in September 2020 than it did in September 2019 because the world looks different. So Shauna, can you talk to us briefly about what the academic program looks like for a student um, right now, uh, given that we're in, in COVID times? And then maybe Lindsay, you could speak to what the well-being program looks like right now during these times, how we're supporting our students. So we have students that are present in class and we have students that are present remotely, which is a new experience for everybody. And so that is probably one of the biggest differences that we see with our students and our faculty navigating how do you build a community when some of your students are face to face and some of them are, you know, a face on a screen. Uh, but the learning that they're doing isn't fundamentally changed by that. What the teachers are thinking about is when do students actually need the teacher to be with them, pushing their thinking, pressing for uh, depth um, and challenging them? And when can students be learning on their own asynchronously as Garth talked about? And when is there something in the middle? And so students are face to face with their teachers um, three periods out of four. 
And one of the periods is an asynchronous design period very deliberately, which is new for us. And so students and teachers are navigating what does that mean? How do you become a responsible student when there's nobody telling you what to do all of the time? And actually our kids are really thriving in that. So I would say that's probably one of the biggest differences that we've seen this year. Thanks, Seanad. And I think it's important for parents to note that when we were building our program and, and Seanad, Garth and Lindsay really spent um, their time from March right through till, till August building this program, how one of the big focuses for us was how do we ensure that our girls can be on campus every day and they've achieved that through an incredible amount of work so our students uh, can be on campus every day jk to grade 12. and so lindsay with that in mind maybe you could speak to the well-being programs that are being run right now um, particularly as they support the girls during this time thank you maggie and yes i mean a big part of this program is that the students have been able to be on campus all day jk to grade 12 five days a week so with that opportunity, we looked at building in other parts to their day other than just their academics that would support them as they came back to school. So there are things, some things under COVID that we may, might typically have done that we have not been able to do as easily, but it didn't mean we wanted to neglect that program. So instead we built it into the student's day. So let's say, for example, um, the well-being program, I've talked about how that's built into stu every student's every day from JK to 12. But we also built the student's co-curricular program into their every day, um, into their program throughout the day. So for JK to grade six, that may that that looks differently. And it's it's a portion of their day where there's special programming brought in um, that's really given the kids a great sense of fun and play beyond their academic program. That is also a lot of fun for them. Um, but it has given them an, an extra layer of programming and an extra set of enjoyment, I would say, that these students are having right now in their everyday. In grade seven to grade 12, there's co-curricular program as well built into their schedule. And for us right now, what that looks like and sounds like, it sounds like a lot of students outdoors here with a lot of noise and a lot of um, enjoyment. So my window out here right now, often during the day, I will have students partaking in you know, theater programming, Scottish dancing, the biggest hit has been spike ball. And thus we, we, we can't see, the students play spike ball now as part of their co-curricular programming. At lunchtime, we find students playing spike ball. But this has all been with the goal of not only having students here all day, but also knowing that there's some individualized programs that students might typically have really um, enjoyed at school and can't be offered at this time. So instead of saying, fine, then we will just do their academics, we thought, what could we offer? And when I ask the students right now, they are really enjoying it. And so they'll say, oh, I, didn't, I didn't know coming back to school would, would, would be so good. And I really quite like this new school program at the moment. Um, another big part of our upper school is student leadership. So again, our student leaders have had to reinvent most of their programming because it may have been done inter-school in the past or between grades in a way that we can't do it right now. But that hasn't stopped these students at all. Uh, you know, we are opening clubs tomorrow and my email still has examples of students saying, I just thought of another way we could run a club right now. And here's an idea of what we'd like to do. And, and we keep saying to them, great, you know, if they can imagine doing this, you know, this feeds right into our well-being program and a really a sense of hope and optimism that even at this time, these students have been, have been the most resilient of all of the people in this building. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. And I will say as a parent of a grade 12 student, I've really appreciated how the guidance program has been integrated into the well-being time, allowing our, our senior students uh, ample time to be with guidance counselors, to meet with um, folks from different universities as they plan the opposite end of the journey that you're all going through, which is looking at Havergal. They're looking at what's next after Havergal. Garth, I think it's important that um, we talk about the learning management system and, and sort of the projects you're working on that, that will allow us to continue to move forward so well in a blended learning model. Yeah, thanks, Maggie. I think your question about you know, returning to the campus in September um, also requires, required all of us to reflect on what had happened, what had transpired, what have we learned since March up to now? And how can we use that to move forward? One of my key projects out of HCX is the addition of a, what I like to refer to 
as a new digital campus. So we are rolling out what is traditionally known as a learning management system, but it will be much more than that. It'd be a place for us to actually build community online. We're using a, a provider called Schoolbox out of Australia. A really, it will be a differentiator for us for sure. Um, and I'm excited to say that it will be able to be personalized to the families themselves based on what courses the students are taking and what co-curriculars or well-being or, or clubs, as Lindsay was mentioning, what leadership they're involved with as well. So we're really excited about that. And that came out of the key learning that we need to have a robust online digital campus for our students and families. Thanks, Garth. Appreciate that. Um, so some questions have popped in. Um, we've got a number of them here. So I'm going to start with uh, a question that's uh, joining a JK to 12 school in grade seven may feel daunting at the best of times. Given COVID cohort limitations and the possibility that this might continue, has the school taken any extra steps to facilitate wider social integration for new girls? And Lindsay, I know this is, I'm swerving right in, into your lane, but I'm gonna attempt to answer this first. Um, as part of my role when we look at retention, it is about the looking at how girls integrate into the school and how families integrate in the school. And I've worked with all three of the people on this panel as well as the heads of school on ensuring that our newest students do feel very much a part of the community and our families do. And that's not something that we worry about just in September. We know when you're new, you're new all year. It's all first, so lots of check-in points. And I will say, having checked in with all of our new families, we did both a survey and phoned our new families, uh, the girls are feeling really, really connected. And I think that came through our form teachers. Um, it came through our house system. Uh, our girls here are pretty incredible and inclusion is a big part of what makes the Havergal community so special. And uh, Lindsay and Sean could both attest to the number of ways our students approached us this summer to say, I have an idea for how we can help our new girls. Um, and it was fantastic. Uh, and I wish we'd had orientation week for six weeks to integrate all of their, um, their uh, ideas. But we did use both um, form teachers our and our guidance counselors to make sure there were lots of check-in points and lots of ways for girls to connect. And that's something that we'll continue to um, monitor and work on for next year. Lindsay, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I, Maggie, I think you've said it very well, but it is the multiple touch points for those students. The form teacher, the advisor, the guidance counselor will check in with all of those new students. But I'd also say, I think the modified schedule that we have had to run because of COVID has provided more opportunities for these students and really given them a sense of belonging because everyone is in the same program this year. And so they're with their cohort and they're with their group that they instantly felt that they were part of the program that was going on and not separate from it in some way. And interestingly, right down to our newest learners, our junior kindergarten girls, and, and Havergal made the decision fairly early on that all students in the school and all staff and all faculty would be wearing masks. And our junior school students actually um, started, uh, you can imagine starting kindergarten and you're wearing a mask and your teacher's wearing a mask. They actually started with bringing in, part of what they did was they had pictures of each other so they knew what they looked like without a mask on. Um, but they played, they had a lot of time um, really just talking about what they could do. Uh, looking at all of the positives of what they could do now that they were at school, which really helped them to feel connected to the building, not just to the people. Um, which has made for a really seamless transition for our girls. Um, another question has popped in here, and it's an interesting question. Um, it's, could you please give me some de details about the current diversity ratio at the school and how the new strategic direction is planning on focusing on the same? Um, I'm just trying to click on answer live here. Um, when we look at our student population, we actually at the moment don't track um, race or ethnicity. Um, we, under the human rights law, actually have been told that we 
couldn't. We're looking at how we can um, apply to be an institution that can track that so we can have a better understanding of our student body in that way. But our student body, I would say, really does mirror the makeup of Toronto um, and, and of the neighborhoods from which we draw on. But we've actually got a very robust um, DEI strategy that's being run by our manager of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think all four of us who sit on this panel right now are leading different groups. So for me, I'm leading a group called student representation. And I think it's exactly what you're talking about. It's meeting, it includes old girls, students, and interested faculty members on how we can increase um, the breadth of student representation at the school and how we can support student representation at the school because it's also about having a culture once you're in the school that is inclusive. Um, and it is something that we live in our values, but something we are working to get better at every day. Shauna, um, do you wanna talk about the um, ways this has been integrated into the academic program? Sure, Maggie. I mean, the concepts of diversity, equity, inclusion, are very well integrated into our academics, especially in our literacy program and in our social sciences program uh, in very tangible ways. And so when children are um, you know, introduced to an idea in well-being that is connected to diversity, equity, and inclusion, quite often the teachers will follow up with that uh, in their literacy program or in their social sciences program. And our teachers have spent quite a lot of time looking at how do we uh, incorporate concepts from the Truth and Reconciliation Report into the school, um, and how do we actually look at um, uh, questions of history from different points of view. And the group that I'm part of is a, a curriculum auditing group. And so our students are helping us look at uh, the teaching that we're doing and um, the ideas that we're representing and we're taking their lens on that and making modifications uh, with their suggestions to make sure that we are representing all of our students uh, in ways that they think um, are, would serve them better. So it's been a very interesting process and it's an ongoing process as the students this year are going to be reflecting back to us at several points in the year. What does it look like for them now? Thank you. Garth, do you want to speak to um, Monique's role and, and how, you know, that, that lives under the umbrella of HCX um, to a certain extent? Um, I know it, it lives with well-being and it lives in all areas of the school, but do you want to talk to that a little bit and what, how this is intersecting with your area? Yeah, thanks, Maggie. Um, in the creation of our DQ course, again, running from grades five to eight, um, our director, sorry, our manager of DEI was actually involved in the course creation. And we have diversity, equity, and inclusion outcomes built into that course itself. And so out of HCX is coming new programming. Monique Miller, who's our, our manager, she's actually involved in the creation of these programmings, providing us with that lens. I'd also say, because I'm going to turn over to Lindsay for a second, um, but before I do, I would also say that uh, in my role with the professional learning, it's supporting our faculty in, in skilling up, right, in understanding how in an institution that is 126 years old, how we can meaningfully integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion into our studies, into our programming, uh, both existing and uh, yet to come. But I would I'd turn it over to Lindsay now because I know that Monique has been working with Lindsay closely in the well-being area as well. This summer, Monique led a group of educators who worked together to build what we call our student diversity, equity, and inclusion training. And they have built a curriculum that is being um, that's being taught throughout the school, JK to grade 12. And it, it's pretty awesome because the some of the same lessons actually are being taught JK to grade 12. So we know that the primary students are having some of the same discussions, although they will look very different um, 
as, as some of our senior students. And um, Monique and her team have used the social justice standards that have, been put out, that have been put out by Teaching Tolerance as our benchmark. So being able to really make use of their research and their standards so that we make sure that we're benchmarking ourselves outside of this institution and against really good standards um, for what diversity, equity, and inclusion should look like and feel like. As well, we are working with students around their own agency and how, what role does that play in making sure that students feel, feel heard, valued, and understood here at Havergal. So, I mean, in essence here, there's so, we've gone at this in many different areas so that we, we, can, we, can, we can address this in many different ways within the culture of the school. And I know, um, you know, we're looking at it from social media, from all sorts of areas. What I'm really pleased about is how the work in this area in combination with what we know about best practices in teaching and learning and in well-being has informed our admission process. So you will know that from JK to grade eight, we are no longer using a standardized test. Um, and we're, at, we're also, you know, we're keenly aware of where all students are, are at um, in their through, through COVID and all, the, all of the changes that have happened. And we wanted to make sure our process really allowed students to shine with not only what they know, but, but how they think and who they are as, as people. So our processes are really based on our values, um, even in our student uh, confidential profile that teachers and coaches fill out. It's all values-based questions. And our interview is based on values-based questions and the assessment that takes place within the interview is really about understanding where students are at through conversation. We wanted to make sure that students who'd had an excellent remote learning experience were able to shine um, in what they've learned over the last month, as well as what they learned over the three months uh, that school was closed but also that students who perhaps didn't have access to the technology that would have allowed them to learn um, in a manner that pushed them forward perhaps a little quicker, were also able to shine and articulate how they learn to show their critical thinking skills, their problem solving skills, and to show why courage, compassion, inquiry, integrity means something to them. So really it has, it has affected um, all areas of the school in a positive way. And by no means is Havergal checking a box to say that we've got this. It's something that we will work on continuously and we're really, really pleased that our entire uh, community has been involved in moving this forward. I don't see any more questions, so I think I'm gonna wrap it up here, but I do hope that for all of the families who joined us, First, I hope this gave you a good insight into Havergal, not only where we are right now, but where we're, we're moving as we look to the future. And I'll hope, I hope you'll join us for one of our open houses, a Tuesday with the team, uh, or you'll tune into one of our podcasts. Uh, the admissions team is here to help you through this process. We want you to find the best school for you and your daughter. So anything we can do to help with that, please do get in touch. So thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you to our panelists. And we will end the meeting now. Thank you very much.